nothing's better than fresh fruit from the garden. I just can't say that enough. This particular plant will actually shoot up additional leaf tissue. The program was to create food for the public. They are public orchards. It's a lot of work, but it really is worth it when you see all these blooms and it's gorgeous. Hello and welcome to Great Gardening. I'm Dennis Lamkin, your host for the evening. We have our garden experts with us tonight. They are horticulturalist and educator Bob Olin and garden professional Deb Burns Erickson. As always, we want to hear from gardeners across the region who have questions for our experts on all things gardening. Volunteers from the St. Louis County Master Gardeners Program are here to answer phones. Call locally at 218-788-2847 or you can just email us at uh, ask at wdse.org. How about this? Current conditions, it's Beautiful. spring. Beautiful. Tropical what? and Zim today, 72 <laughs> degrees. 72. <laughs> 72. What a difference a week can make. Yeah, yeah, I think we launched in the spring and maybe almost in the summer. 72 and Zim. I think so, yeah. That's mm -hmm. great. Yeah. Oh, some buds. Spring is here in our region, and we wanted to take a look uh, back at gardens of Dina Post and Dave uh, Pagel. Uh, at their beautiful water features. I'm Dina Post. And, and I'm Dave Pago. And this is, um, we're on Woodland Avenue, and welcome to our garden. <laughs> when we originally bought this property, we inherited the goldfish pond that's down there. So we cleaned that all up and kind of started there and developed outward from there. And being on Woodland Avenue, where there's a lot of traffic, you know, the water noise is something that we were really looking for. So we just have expanded outward, adding water features. The upper one is, um, that is our kind of bird bath thing. And the thing that makes the bird bath is an old Chinese um, grist mill stone, milling stone. Uh, and then the trough, it's a solid block of sandstone. Um, that's been hollowed out and it came from um, China and then we fitted it with some uh, sort of vintage looking faucets and then landscaped with some of the local brownstone that's salvaged material. There's something about rock that we just think is so beautiful in the garden. As a kid I collected rocks all the time and Dave's degree is in geology and so we've always liked rocks. And then Dina softened it all up with the plants and the pots and everything, and so together it works pretty well. Bob, you wanted to talk about some uh, early spring gardening activities, what we can do. Sure, it's still early spring. First, I just have to compliment uh, that, the couple on our last video. I think it's that's gorgeous. spectacular landscaping and property and uh, uh, what they've done with the hardscapes. Mm -hmm. And you know, when I take a look at this time of year, I think it's very early spring. So we really have a couple things, and, and I think if you divide it this way, first look at your landscape, and then you can think, look at your vegetable and your flower garden. So in the landscape, first off, get out there and thoroughly clean some up. Uh, there was a lot of debris, there was a lot of uh, limbs that were lost, pine cones, pine needles. Uh, get that all cleaned up. They use a nice uh, fan rake to do it. And then you want to repair any garden structures. Think of the hard structures, the paving. And there was a little bit of frost heaving there under, under some of these structures this last winter. So take care of all that. Prune up your shrubs and trees while they're still dormant. And uh, we might get another day or two. Those buds are going to pop real fast, but it's over the hill at least. Uh, they hadn't broken yet this morning. They're still dormant. Go ahead and prune them. And then you've got uh, herbaceous perennials. Uh, we've talked a little bit about uh, several of them. And if, they're, if they bloom on new wood, then you want to trim out all that old wood. Anything that's brittle and dry at this point, we might leave them for bees and in winter interest, but take that all out at this time. And then now we can start thinking about planting uh, your bare root tree stock and your perennials. As long as the frost is out, you can certainly put those in the ground now. The earlier, the better. And then take a soil test, send it in either University of Minnesota, University of Wisconsin, or if you elect to a private lab, and uh, then you'll get those results back in time for some of your spring planting. Lots you can do right now, but stay on the landscape, stay out of the, uh, certainly out of the vegetable or the flower gardens. Uh, again, some of the don'ts, uh, you want to stay off the real wet areas. We don't want compaction. We got a lot of heavy soils, we got clay soils. So that, don't add insult to injury by uh, compacting this. Let's not till. Uh, we, we are getting away from over tilling. Uh, certainly if it's wet and it's muddy, you can clump things up and you can overtill. Uh, so avoid c compaction just in general. 
And the obvious things, don't, uh, don't plant any frost sensitive plants. We're a long ways away from uh, when we have frost free dates, that's gonna be early June. And then um, you wanna be very careful. Let's not apply uh, any type of chemical fertilizers at this point. Wait till the plants are actively growing. That can happen very quickly, but we have an opportunity certainly. So let's not get, jump the gun too early. Plenty of things you do in the landscape. The vegetable and flower gardens are gonna come a little, a little bit later. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Uh, next, next uh, let's talk about the right tools to use in the garden. Uh, let's head over to Burns Greenhouse where Deb showed us some of the tools uh, that she uses regularly. Some of the basic tools in a greenhouse are obviously a watering hose and wand and the ends for it. Something so that you can cut through stuff and in case you need to ever either fertilize or spray, a sprayer is really nice for that. This is a Fisker and it cuts everything and anything. It's got a spring, so that's really, really helpful. It's not as tiring to use. So we use a really light hose. If you have a long hose, or you're doing a lot of watering or you're dragging that hose all over, um, look for something that's light and maybe not as much volume because you're dragging all that water with you. And this one we like because it's got a, a head that you can change out and it's got all kinds of useful sprays. So if you're trying to get rid of pests, these are handy to have. This is a really nice head. A uh, good head gives you good volume and gives you a good um, spray. You can set the amount that goes on and then the volume and the way the spray goes. Really easy to use, really handy in a greenhouse. You can also use them outside when you're planting. Whatever you're gonna use as a spray and it'll tell you this is one tablespoon per gallon. Another tool in the greenhouse that we use, we use chickens, but we also have roosters. Chickens help clean up some of the pests in the winter. We have sheep. We don't use any herbicides in our greenhouse or pesticides, so we use our sheep to come in and clean up all the weeds. We love all of our animals. They all help the farm run and the greenhouse run. Uh, Bob, you know, when we're starting to get into the landscape, maybe we can talk about the kind of rakes and things that we should use. Uh, Pretty simple, really, but we've got, uh, when we take a look at rakes, we've got a couple of them, and here's two of them, yeah. uh, just a fan or lawn rake on the, on the right there. On the left, we've got a garden rake, and that really has no place in the, in the, le in the actual uh, lawn or turf areas. You don't want to be pulling out thatch. We don't have a lot of thatch in zone three, zone four. We just don't have that long a growing season and we haven't really been managing that intensely. So use that, that lawn rake just to sweep up some of the litter where there's very little damage done to the actual soil area. You've got underground rhizomes and stolons on those grass plants that are just below the surface, so let's not damage them thinking we're doing a, a proper cleanup they're technique. Up, uh, Great. Well, we've got a lot of questions. They just, uh, they're coming in like crazy. Uh, Ruth from Duluth, when is a good time to spread weed and feed on the lawn? Well, that's if you want to spread weed and feed. Some people <laughs> might say never, but uh, we do have a thing called no mow may, which is another topic yeah. here. But uh, I would say again, uh, a multi-purpose product like that, always read the directions. The weed and feed is going to go on uh, when the lawn is damp after the irrigation or after a rainfall event so that the herbicide granules stick to the broadleaves. So that's going to be something that's uh, really critical with that type of combination product. But be careful about the use of something like that. Okay. Julie from Hermantown, how do we get uh, Devil's Paintbrush uh, Orange Hawkweed out of the yard? Aha. Uh -huh. so you There's weed and one. feed. I mean, will that touch yeah, it, Yeah, we Bob? just talked to weed and feed. Probably not. Yeah. Uh, it has a very hairy uh, leaf, so my advice First off, it's going to grow in a low fertility area. So you want a soil test, you want to manage your fertility. Bluegrass, if you want to establish that, or other grass species, you need more nitrogen if orange hawkweed is in there. So you want to think about that. If you're just going to get it out, then you're going to have to use some type of an herbicide, but you're going to need uh, what we call a surfactant, which is a non-sudsing soap, so it breaks down the product bubbles, so it spreads through that hairy leaf surface and gets down to the actual herbaceous part of the leaf. And sticks yeah. to it. And the fall is going to be better for you than it is this time of year as well. John from Duluth has a 50-year-old uh, Christmas cactus. Uh, how should he go about watering it and fertilizing it? Well, watering it, it, it the, the cactus will give you clues. It will get a really dark green. It'll 
go a little to wilt when it wants water. You don't want to go too much wilt. You don't want to stress it too much, but it will tell you, and um, you can feel the soil, obviously, with these great tools that we have. And um, you'll be able to tell if the soil is dry. Um, and then it also depends on where you have it located, if it's near um, full sun indoors, or if you bring it outside, and depending on the location, how much water it will use. But generally, it will tell you, and you, you, don't, you can't get on a schedule with it. You, it, you just have to touch it, feel it, and look at it, and it, it should let you know. And a lot of times, you don't need to do much fertilizing on those. They're very low maintenance, and 50 years old, that's tremendous. And as you see, the great tools we have, like this moisture meter right here. So get and check that soil level and uh, don't overwater those. Mm, no. Don't over transplant those. Don't overfeed over those. Yep. Uh, they really are low maintenance plants. And maybe yeah. think about getting some cuttings off of it for the future generations Very if definitely. it's 50 years old. You'll yeah. want to preserve that and pass it on. And you know my heartbreak story. I lost my grandmother's uh, <laughs> Christmas cactus when I set it outside and the deer found it. So coming back, but take some cuttings just so you got a little protection little, if it's an little little insurance. insurance. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, back to our uh, Duluth peony. Uh, last week, uh, where can, uh, can uh, Linda from Duluth get them? Well, we're, we're, we were, my aunt is now looking for them. She said she's found some and that we should have them this weekend going into next week. And then we'll also be bulking them up for next year. But we hope to have them by the beginning of Mon by Monday, Tuesday. So. And there may be some more around Minneapolis or yeah, the Twin there's, Cities. There's some nurseries in the Twin Cities yeah. that still have them. Old time variety introduced in the 30s, but it's those oldies that are goodies. Mm -hmm. I like that expression as we age a little bit, <laughs> Dennis. <laughs> Why do you look at me? <laughs> uh, how do I know when it's time to plant my mm -hmm. vegetable seeds in the ground? Well, soil temperature. Soil temperature is a key thing there, and you want to stay away from warm season crops because cool and moist this time you're probably looking at the third week in May you want temperatures up oh, at least 50 50s. degrees in that upper soil surface mm -hmm. area uh, and um, again if you're going to go any earlier you better have them treated with some kind of fungicide because we can lose a lot of warm season crops if they go in too early and the temperature is too cold. And the cool season ones you could start ahead of time get some good root on them yeah, before you put them into the ground do some transplants don't don't transplant your own until you have good root on it because right. that root really makes a difference when you put it in the ground mm -hmm. for survival mm -hmm. uh, Stephen in uh, twig area has hydrangeas and he's had them in the ground for about seven years and they've never bloomed oh that's uh, interesting is it wow. too hot he has them planted on the east side of his house. East no. side of the house, east and side. good fertility. And we don't know the hydrangea, yeah. but I will share my experience with uh, Endless Summer, which is one of the original introductions <laughs> of that whole series from <laughs> one of our good nurseries in the mm -hmm. south. We found a little stress hurts. So if, if they're just growing vegetatively, there's plenty of fertility, plenty of sunlight, plenty of water. Uh, we haven't really stressed them enough to trigger bloom. Well, and it could be a pH too, depending on where they're planted. I've seen a lot of different hydrangeas react if it's near a foundation and mm -hmm. you've got, you know, um, a little bit higher pH and then yeah. they could be struggling. Depends on if it looks good and it's yeah. got good vigor, you know, it could be light. I mean, mm -hmm. if they've got filtered sun, they might need some more sun too. It's kind of, uh, the original is more challenging. Try, try some of the newer introductions. They bloom just a little bit better because that has been one of the downsides of some of the early uh, hydrangeas that were introduced. Okay. Mary from Hibbing, she has a four foot deep uh, raised bed and she plants Cosmos, Morning Glorias and Zinnias and they don't usually bloom until late September. What's wow. she doing wrong? <laughs> wow. Okay, location and how much sun is that bed getting? Yeah. Sun I mean, and warmth, uh, potentially yeah. she didn't tell but us the still exposure. Still it's above ground, no, so. she doesn't tell us the, no, the um, exposure. You know, you got to be aware, even in the middle of the summer, the sun is in the south. And I if you're having an issue like that, she's not getting uh, early enough growth uh, so that we can set it. The other possibility, raised beds, oftentimes there's too much nitrogen fertilizer that's going in there. So you, if you're using a water soluble, take, spin the box around. We've got so much nitrogen in that first number when you really want phosphorus and potassium to encourage bloom. So maybe initially the nitrogen when the plant's starting to grow, but then you have to trigger that 
that reproductive process and typically higher phosphorus and potassium levels are going to do that for you. And she might want to get some transplants to add to it if she's seeding it because that seed germinating takes a while or start that seed earlier because yeah. that's going to mm -hmm. make a huge difference if she starts it ahead of time and gets it into the ground. Cindy has uh, planted uh, bulbs and dahlias. She reads on the instructions that she's supposed to dig them up after the first frost. What if she just leaves them in the ground? They're dead. They're dead. They're yeah. dead. That dahlia is dead, turns to mush. <laughs> yeah. Dead. She's got to get that. Yeah, good Sorry, Cindy. Sorry. You've got to Sorry. You get them out of the ground. Yeah. That's one of those lovely uh, fall tasks, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. they don't take the winter. Mary from Virginia asks if tomato leaves are uh, poisonous. Uh, can they be put in the compost pile? Can rhubarb leaves go in the compost pile? Oh, boy, she asks some interesting questions. The um, the tomato, we'll start with that first. Um, you know, it's sold in ACA. We never recommend consumption. Any part of the of leaf tissue in general, but partic particularly in that family, fruit is never poisonous. Uh, the leaves themselves are not particularly toxic, but there would be a little bit of that potential issue. Compost, and there's never going to be an issue there. There is an issue with disease and insects. You've got to be a little careful what you put in, but the leaves themselves will break down very readily. Don't be concerned at all about that. And her other question? Part rhubarb. Of the question was rhubarb leaves. Rhubarb. Uh, that's very interesting because that the leaves do contain oxalic acid and that can be uh, poisonous so you never want to eat the leaves. Mm -hmm. The stems are never poisonous unless we get a late frost and we had that uh, just last year in some places, year before. If it actually wilts the plant because uh, rhubarb will be up by that time, then we can get accumulation of this oxalic acid in the uh, stalk itself, throw it out. So if it hasn't wilted, the stalk is never poisonous. If it has wilted, I would discard it because it can accumulate some of the oxalic acid from the leaves. Interesting. Uh, Tom from Washburn, uh, when is it safe to uh, put out his onion sets? Onion sets. Oh, go right now. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's perfectly safe. They'll take, uh, uh, even if they're actively growing, they'll take 20, 18, 19, 20 degrees. So go ahead and set them out right now. And Sharon from Lakeside, has a question on uh, the deer keep going through her yard and they're eating everything in her yard. Uh, besides uh, fencing, what can she do? Well, it's not, she has some options during the summer. And I, I think uh, obviously, and I've always been criticized a little bit for this, I like good fences because I've, <laughs> that's the only thing I know of that stops. I mean, you can have a combination of electric and steel fences, but uh, you know, we've got uh, several of these moisture uh, these irrigation system sprinklers that are triggered by Scarecrow. motion, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. those are really quite effective. Um, I think if you have a pet, uh, certainly a dog will be very effective as well, just scaring them off, not running, but scaring them off being a, a presence there. Uh, but uh, repellents will be useful up mm -hmm. to a point, mm -hmm. constantly rotate them. Mm -hmm. uh, they get used to these types of things, so rotate them, move them, and if you're going to fence, never let them get a chance to eat anything or they'll tear a fence down. Right, if they and know start early. Start right away. Yeah, the sooner you can train them to go mm -hmm. around, the, the better yeah. your results will be. Okay, uh, let's, uh, thanks, that in good information. Let's talk about the right tools to use when you're uh, working in your garden, when you're pruning and trimming and things. And I brought some of my own uh, tools. Um, I brought a, a ratchet pruner. Uh, if you have weak hands, you can, uh, it, it ratchets down on a branch and you can take uh, something that's, uh, you know, an inch, inch and a half with uh, something like this where you have a good ratcheting pruner and it's very tough. Um, you, this is a, uh, an anvil type pruner and an anvil type pruner is uh, has a, a, a moving blade and a station and a uh, uh, solid uh, surface to cut against and the only time I use these uh, because they do crush the plant material obviously you're cutting it and then you're crushing it is when I'm uh, uh, cutting roses for uh, use um, uh, in displays and that sort of thing or if I'm cutting peonies and that sort of thing because it does crush the, the uh, root tissue then we have a secateur or a bypass pruner. And this one has an articulating handle. So again, if you have a little difficulty with your hands, uh, uh, that sort of thing, this is a nice pruner. It's exceptionally sharp. Uh, it's a good um, product uh, to use. Uh, I use them on a regular basis. M one of my favorites 
is this uh, miniature pruner. And this is, is a, a spring, it's kind of like the ones that Deb showed earlier. Uh, it's a spring loaded, but it's for deadheading. It's for pruning uh, smaller uh, shrubs, trees, uh, that sort of thing, boxwoods even if you want have a couple of wild hairs and you want to clean them off. It's great for something like that. Um, if you've got a big branch to take, uh, these are loppers. And uh, these are extended handle loppers. These you can take up to about a four inch branch, uh, three and a half, four inch branch. Uh, they are uh, great. They have a lot of leverage and they'll clean up your yard very nicely. If that's uh, not quite right, uh, you can always go to the to the. Uh, put my mic on here. Um, you can go to the saw, and this is a, tele, a telescoping saw that you can use. It's handy in the garden. You can see my tools are clean. I clean them after every use, and I uh, I do sanitize the blades if I've cut uh, anything that I think is diseased. I uh, use uh, just regular uh, 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 alcohol wipes that sort of thing. And one of my new favorite tools, Bob is gonna steal it, I'm sure, <laughs> is this, <laughs> is this uh, battery powered steel chainsaw. Um, this you can take up to about an eight inch uh, limb or something, uh, branch with something like this. Uh, no gas motor, no n nothing. You do put a little oil on the blade as you're using it, but it's an extremely handy tool to use uh, small, portable, you can carry it with you, uh, keep it in the toolbox, uh, clean it up afterwards, recharge the battery, and you're, you're good to go for next year. Then we have some uh, interesting pruner here too. This is a kind of a long reach pruner that, um, that I use. Uh, if you have vines on your house or you have, uh, maybe you even have a hanging planter that has some, uh, some unusual uh, uh, branches that are hanging down, this will prune them. One of the advantages of a pruner like this is it not only cuts it, but it holds whatever you've cut. So you can bring it back down and put it into the, into your uh, waste receptacle or into your compost pile or whatever you might need. Then I think we have a slide of a couple of other uh, tools here. Uh, there's a long reach pruner. Uh, that, the one on the right, has a, uh, a saw blade, but it also has a, a, uh, an actuating uh, uh, cutting blade that will uh, take things up. And you can adjust the handle, bring them up to about 20 feet with that in order to, uh, to cut something that you need. Um, the, uh, the other one, is the green one on the left, is an articulating um, uh, hedge trimmer. And that's you know great. It, it, you can get you can adjust the handle on that. It's battery operated again. And if you have arborvitae in your yard, for example, at a and a hedge, and you're trying to keep them level, that you can use uh, to do that. We do. We have arborvitae between our property lines, and it um, it's a great tool for that. The next slide over the uh, there's a battery operated uh, 20 inch uh, blade uh, hedge uh, trimmer. I use that when I'm knocking down a hedge to bring it down to a manageable height. Say it's gotten out of hand and, and it uh, needs to be uh, done. And then the other two are just hand pruners, a uh, regular hedge trimmer and then a shaping hedge trimmer. Um, some nice tools. Nice and clean. And don't you agree <laughs> it's money well spent? Absolutely. If yeah. It's like a carpenter. If you have good tools, you, they'll do a good job for you. Dennis, you're right. I have a little tool envy here. Yeah, we believe in multi-purpose tools. It'll prune up your apple trees. It's not bad for self-defense either. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, let's get into some questions. We, uh, uh, Tracy from Hibbing asks, is it too early to uh, rake her lawn? Oh no, you want to get out and rake uh, lightly. You know, take yeah. the litter off. We don't want to be down there raking in any of the uh, actual plant material. Don't be too aggressive. Don't be mm -hmm. too aggressive. Yeah. Because, because of uh, potential pollinators living on the ground, should we wait until the soil reaches 50 degrees to turn it over for planting? Well, that won't hurt. No, it, it wouldn't hurt really if you're not using that. I, I think that uh, 
you know, it's undisturbed areas, so people don't need to be concerned. There's some areas like where your turf is and so forth where there probably aren't uh, native bee nests, mm -hmm. but it's, it's and more and more we'd like to see areas that are left undisturbed and the litter on there, and you may not want to turn those at all, mm. you know, just to dedicate a portion. Leave an for, area, yeah, right. A given area, we're yep. just going to leave that alone where the uh, native bees will be mm -hmm. uh, overwintering. Uh, Dave from Pike Lake uh, has a, an apple tree in his backyard and he's laying a new patio. Uh, how close can he get to the, to, the, uh, to the roots? Right, depends on how much soil compaction is going into this patio and really you, you've got to watch your drip line and yep. you've got to watch your, um, your, how much pressure you're putting on in compaction. Sure. Nice thing about apples, they do have a tap root that's running down. so. You know, the drip line, you want to be out where that the extension of the branches are going to be, if at all possible. But you might get away with being a little closer just because of the way that root system happens to grow. And how mature it is and how much more it's going to grow. And he's going to get more roots on the one side, so we have to be a little careful. It might need some support at some point in the future. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, uh, thank you all for tuning in to Great Gardening. If you want more, you can follow us on Instagram at Great Gardening WDSE. You can subscribe to uh, youtube.com slash uh, great gardening or like us on WDSE WRPT on Facebook. If you missed any part of the show, it'll be posted on our YouTube channel and our PBS video app tomorrow morning. Thanks, Bob and Deb. Uh, we'll be back next week and Thank let's you, get out there and enjoy our time in the garden. Mm -hmm.